What is up, Dynasty Leaguers? Welcome into another episode of Drafting Lessons, the DLF TV show where I grab a guest every single week and we run through a Dynasty startup mock draft. And today's episode has been something that we've been trying to get uh, planned for three months now. Uh, I think that's what you tweeted out, Bobby. But uh, I'm so happy to have you here. Bobby Koch of DLF, uh, is a huge super flex and quarterback guy. So I thought it would be a perfect opportunity to do a super flex mock draft and talk through the strategy with you. But, but Bobby, how's it going, man? It's going well. I'm happy to be here. Uh, you know, a little something known as a pandemic, I guess, got in the way of us recording this. <laughs> uh, I'm still recording out of my parents' house. So that's part of the complications, but happy to be here. Happy to talk super flex and quarterbacks with you, especially because I know it's not a, your particular favorite format. So it's <laughs> even more enjoyable to be here and watch you squirm a little. Yeah, it's, it's, it's whatever. I, I feel like everybody knows my um my reasoning on why I I'm not in on Superflex, but um yeah, I don't I don't hate it. Um it's just not preferred. Um but yeah, so I'm glad that uh, I have you here to be able to to talk through different strategies and stuff because there are a wide range of you know superflex strategies and way that you can attack a superflex startup, you know, that you can win in multiple different ways. I know I was talking with uh, Matt Price just a couple of weeks ago and his super flex strategy is he wants to grab one of those elite guys to anchor that position. Um, and then just kind of fill out the rest of it later on, maybe grab like a young, like a Joe Burrow or a Tua, some uh, a rookie and then pair that rookie with uh, an older vet to kind of have that one, two combo in the super flex there. Um, I've, you know, I've had John Hogan. I think we all know how he approaches super flex. Um, and then uh, Sam Wallace, just, just this last week, was on as well too and and he kind of um has a, has a, a fluid approach to how he addresses super flex he likes to go um kind of similar to matt prices but if he doesn't get those guys um he's you know pretty good with spreading those uh quarterbacks out as well too so i'm interested bobby um as the uh as a two quarterback guy and a super flex guy what is your uh, if you have one, like an overall generic super flex strategy, what are you trying to do whenever you attack these these startups? It's very similar to Matt's. Uh, it's also kind of similar to John's, although John goes way <laughs> more quarterback heavy. John and I have thought about this, even though it's somewhat semantics, where John says you have to come away from your draft with four quarterbacks. I think if you have four quarterbacks on your starting roster, or sorry, just drafting four quarterbacks who are starters, you need to trade one of them because you're wasting trade value on your bench. So I like to come away with three quarterbacks generally that are starters. And similar to Matt, I like to get that one elite guy towards the beginning in the first or second round generally, and then kind of figure it out later on. Although if value falls to me, I'll do it. I had a startup recently where I got both Kyler Murray and Deshaun Watson. And that's kind of fun because now I basically, at least ideally, don't have to worry about the quarterback position for the next decade. <laughs> right. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. Cool. So, I mean, that that seems to be a pretty general approach. Yeah. I mean, I mean John takes it to a whole nother level. Um, but, you know, being able to grab young stud quarterbacks at the beginning of your draft and just kind of put an emphasis on that gives you a lot of uh, flexibility and fluidity throughout the rest of the draft to kind of say, you know, this might be a good time to pick up a Matthew Stafford here who's going to be a solid QB too because I already have Deshaun Watson, Dak Prescott, maybe Mahomes or Lamar as well too. So um, that I, I'm interested to see how this one plays out here. And uh, just to run down uh, what the overall con roster construction is, it's two quarterback. Um, that That's just for the computer, but it's super flex. Uh, two running backs, two wide receiver, a tight end, a regular flex, and then two bench players. That gets us to 10 rounds today. Um, that we're going to mock through and we're going to be doing this out of the 11 spot. Um, so when I click this start your draft button, um, we're just going to go right into it and be on the clock at the 11 spot. Sound good? Yeah, sounds great. All right, let's do it. Alrighty, Bobby, we are on the clock, 111. The first 10 picks went McCaffrey, Saquon, Mahomes, Michael Thomas, Lamar Jackson, Alvin Kamara, Zeke Elliott, Dalvin Cook, DeAndre Hopkins, and Devontae Adams. So at the 111 here, 
Um, I'll just read down the quarterbacks, uh, Kyler, Dak, Deshaun, Russ, everybody but Mahomes and Lamar. Um, running backs, we're looking at Mixon, Nick Chubb, uh, any of the rookies, Clyde or, or Jonathan Taylor, Miles Sanders, Josh Jacobs are all there. Uh, and then a bunch of wide receivers. It's a super deep position I found while doing these. Um, Tyree Kill, Chris Godwin, DJ Moore, Juju, Evans, Mari, any of the tight ends as well, too, um, if you wanted to go that route. But 1.11. What are we looking to uh, to start off our draft here? Just to clarify, this is not a tight end premium, right? Because I might, oh, if no. it was, I might be tempted to go tight end here. But since it's not, uh, I'm going to go with a quarterback that we just discussed, and that's Kyler Murray. I was uh, somewhat anti Kyler Murray, or a little anti his <laughs> hype before the trade for DeAndre Hopkins. But now that he has Hopkins there, and he also finished as the QB seven, I think, in points per game last season. That, and he's so young, there's just no reason not to grab him there and just ha- at least have one very good quarterback for a long time. That's I, I love the pick, Kyler Murray. So um, one question that I have for you, and it's kind of something that I've been seeing a lot more on Twitter, and actually um, we had a YouTube comment about it on Matt Price's video, um, was about taking Kyler Murray over Dak Prescott. Um, and, I'm, and you can probably make the same argument maybe for Deshaun Watson as well too. I don't know, his, his situation is kind of weird just because we don't know what he's going to be like without DeAndre Hopkins, but um, at least Kyler Murray versus Dak Prescott. Is that an easy decision for you? Um, is that an age argument, maybe a contract argument? Um, what's, what's the, uh, the line of thinking there? Yeah. So you kind of hit the nail on the head with both of the things you mentioned. It's really just a difference of age. And also the fact that I know that Kyler will be on his team for a while, whereas there's some question marks about what will happen with Dak. I think the Cowboys will resign him, but It's also just that offense was just starting to figure things out and he was the QB seven. So you think they have another year or two after already having some more practice in that offense. I just think his upside is higher than Dax and Watson. I still really like, I know a lot of people knocked him down after the Hopkins trade. I actually have Watson still ahead of Dak as well. So just a interesting side Mm -hmm. note there. Interesting. I might have to be talking to you after this thing off air about about something going on here. Because that's yeah, that's interesting. Because I mean, Dak, we saw he was quarterback two last year, um, and that was primarily based around a lot of efficiency in terms of he had almost five thousand yards, uh, around like thirty touchdowns, and you know, so th- there's reason to believe that he would regress. But then his situation actually got better. Um, so it's <laughs> it's just kind of a, a weird thing with. With Dak, because they drafted C.D. Lamb, um, you know, Zeke is still there. Amari is still there. Gallup is still there. They goes, Those guys can hopefully get healthy. Jarwin, at least in this point in time in his career, is better than Jason Witten is at this, his point in his career right now. Um, you know, McCarthy was with Aaron Rodgers. He, I think he'll let Dak throw. Um, has the rushing upside, has all of that too. But, yeah, the, the contract situation um, is, is kind of up in the air, although I – I believe, I think as many people do, that he will get re-signed. Um, but it's a question mark and and um, not like a red flag, but it's it's just something that's there that's not there for Kyler Murray. And like you said, you know, with Murray, that offense is trying to figure stuff out. They had like the worst red zone touchdown percentage last year. Like it was literally insane. If 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 he could have thrown for like three or four touchdowns in the red zone instead of kicking all those field goals that they did he'd be a much better fancy quarterback already in his rookie season. So now you add in nuke. Um, it's just, yeah, that, that offense is, is prime for takeoff. And I think a lot of people are getting Cleveland Brown vibes from them. Um, I think it's a different situation, although I understand the similarities and the parallels. Um, I just think it's a, it's going to be a different situation for Kyler. Um, with yeah, just coaching. because Baker Mayfield came out his sophomore year and didn't, performed expectations doesn't mean every exciting rookie quarterback is going to do that. (laughs) And it's also interesting because I hyped Dak last year before Mm -hmm. the season. So it was awesome to see him do so well, but now he's gotten to the point where I actually think his hype is a little too high. And you also mentioned another factor that makes me a little bit lower on him. While we all hated Jason Garrett, he did have some form of stability with Garrett around and his coaching staff. So it's a new coaching staff and we just don't know what they're going to do which is another reason that I have Kyler Murray ahead of him just for the stability. And he started to show it last year and he's younger and contract situation. There's just a lot of question marks around Dak last right now. I think Dak is a, you know, top five to six quarterback in dynasty, but he's not quite in the same tier for Kyler for me at the moment. Interesting. 
All right. Well, uh, we'll move on here to the 2.02. Chubb and Tyreek were the two picks at the turn here for Smile for the Camera. Um, so 2.02 is basically the same player list minus Chubb and Tyreek. So um, all those quarterbacks are still there. Aforementioned Dak, Deshaun, Russell Wilson, if you wanted to go for a, a two QB start off the rip. Mixon, Edward Solaire, Jonathan Taylor, Miles Sanders at running back. Um, and then wide receivers, Godwin, DJ Moore, Juju, Mike Evans, and then still all of those tight ends are also available there if you wanted to go the Kittle Kelsey route. So um 2.02 here uh on the turn. What are we looking to pair and uh start off our draft with uh Kyler Murray here? I'd be really tempted to go Dak here, although uh <laughs> I think we're gonna end up really not liking our running back situation if we don't grab a running back here. And it's interesting because I love Miles Sanders. Um Mixon, I'm somewhat hot and cold on it depends on the day but i think i'm actually going to go with jonathan taylor and the reason i say jonathan taylor is even though he's a rookie and we haven't necessarily seen what he has done on the field there are already people treating him like he's going to be a future first round pick so if he performs at all during his rookie season his adp is just going to boom ridiculously to somewhere in the first round i think and i also happen to like his talent it's a little bit of a riskier pick than i typically would take but uh, it's one that I'm doing based more so on his future dynasty value than uh, his current value. Yeah, I would have I would have honestly pegged you for taking Miles Sanders there whenever you said going for a, a running back position. Um, so that was an interesting pick, and I, I I don't I don't hate it. I, I actually like it a lot. I think Jonathan Taylor landed in a fantastic opportunity for him um, in Indianapolis. It's almost like the NFL version of Wisconsin. <laughs> so it's a, it's a really good situation there for him. Are you concerned at all, um, with, uh, maybe Phillip Rivers's situation there, if they're going to continue to maybe change and, um, have the, the quarterback thing on, uh, up in the air. And then his receiving workload is another one. That's kind of a question. I, I know at least, uh, you know, Miles Sanders has a huge receiving workload. Um, but presumably we'd assume that also Clyde Edwards Hilaire would as well too. Um, fantasy gold there. So what um do you have any of those concerns for Jonathan Taylor or are you just you good to go? Well, you know, he is running behind one of the better offensive lines, and they just added to that. Uh Philip Rivers is a guy who's obviously older and may be out of there soon, but even then, if they bring along another quarterback, and even if it's a rookie, generally rookies and teams with rookies tend to rely on run games. So that makes me think that Taylor will get a lot of usage. And when I'm taking these running backs, especially young ones, I'm really only looking at them for two to three seasons and maybe two seasons because three feels generous. Running backs, as we've seen, tend to lose value really quickly. So maybe I shouldn't have taken him in the second round, actually. <laughs> but at the same time, uh, the running back position is just not that deep. So you do need to reach for these guys and, I've started, I used to be all wide receivers over running backs and I've started building my teams the other way because the wide receiver position does feel very deep. And so I like grabbing guys a little bit early and seeing how my teams pan out with those deeper wide receivers. Um, you know, the other thing that I noticed here, which is interesting, and I may go this route, I have to actually take a look at what quarterbacks are still left too. But uh, Edwards Hilaire is still there for us. So <laughs> we could hedge our bets by grabbing both guys. And, you know, these are the two guys that everyone argues about who the 101 should be. I don't, it's really splitting hairs to me. Um, the main reason I picked Taylor over Hilaire is just that Taylor to me was the better college prospect. And he also was the more hyped up college prospect, whereas Hilaire fell in the better quote unquote landing spot with the Chiefs, which is obviously a great offense. So if you can grab both, uh, may as well. But I do also want to take a look at what quarterbacks uh, the computer left us here. Yeah, so um, this is kind of where you know I said to you off air, I'm not sure about the accuracy of this thing in terms of at least for Dynasty um, because I, I, there's probably 1% of drafts where Clyde Edwards-Hilaire actually makes it to you at the end of the third. Um, let alone possibly the beginning of the third. Yeah, um, I was going to say, I just noticed that Leonard Fournette went before <laughs> Hilaire, and that's definitely not happening in a real draft. Yeah, 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 yeah. So I'll rattle off here all these picks real quick. Mixon, Godwin, Evans, Deshaun Watson, DJ Moore, Russell Wilson, Dak Prescott, Josh Jacobs, George Kittle, Julio Jones, Derek Henry, Juju Smith-Schuster, Josh Allen, Miles Sanders, Leonard Fournette, Amari Cooper, OBJ, Aaron Jones, Austin Eckler, and AJ Brown. So... Um, the players still left available quarterbacks here, Wentz, Baker, 
Joe Burrow, Tua, Matt Ryan, Aaron Rodgers, Daniel Jones, Matthew Stafford, Jared Goff. Um, the running backs, like we said, Edward Solaire, but also J.K., uh, DeAndre Swift, and Cam Akers, the other four rookie running backs outside of Taylor, Kenyon Drake, Melvin Gordon, uh, Todd Gurley are there. Wide receivers, Kenny Galladay, D.K. Metcalf, Calvin Ridley, A-Rob, Cooper Cup, Cortland Sutton, uh, any of the rookies as well, too. Um, and then every tight end except for George Kittle. So Kelsey is also still there. Mark Andrews, Evan Ingram, uh, Zach Ertz, and, and all those guys. So um, 3.11 here. Uh, <laughs> um, are, are, did you want to go Clyde or, or and wait for the turn to go quarterback? Or, or what are we looking at here? Yeah, it feels like cheating because I know he definitely wouldn't be there. <laughs> but I'm going to go Clyde. And part of the reason, so let's say you were facing this scenario. Uh, the reason is that I think he would be more likely to go than the quarterbacks that I want to look at at our turn pick. Mm -hmm. So after this pick, I might go quarterback, but I feel like if I waited to grab Clyde, he might go in the next two picks. So just for the sake of of this, if Clyde isn't there, who would sure. uh, who would your pick have been? <laughs> uh, to go back to the quarterbacks for a second. Yeah. So it probably would have been Joe Burrow or even Travis Kelsey, but probably give the tie break to Joe Burrow. Because the thing is, again, Joe Burrow just had possibly the greatest college quarterback season of all time, or I guess not even possibly, he did have the greatest college quarterback season of all time. And so pairing him with Kyler, and that allows you in your rookie drafts going forward, when everyone's reaching for those quarterbacks, you can grab the talent that falls because you don't really have to worry about it unless you're that worried about your QB3 which by the way, this is where John and I get into some arguments. You shouldn't be that worried about your quarterback three. They should be a guy that you can feel confident about playing when your guys are out or injured. But let's say in this particular team, we took Murray and Burrow. If one of them got injured in any given year, we're probably not winning that year anyway. And I know some people don't like to think that way, but it's just the truth. So you might as well not invest too much in your QB three and try to get as much in your starting lineup as you can. But yeah, so we'll pretend if you want to pretend that uh Hilaire's not here, we can select Burrow. Okay. Now we'll 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 do we'll do a Hilaire. Um I just wanted to get your because honestly, yeah, that my my thinking was correct in that one of the quarterbacks or or the quarterback that you wanted would be back there for 402. So Galladay and Melvin Gordon went at the turn. Um so 4.02 here. Did you do you want to go Burrow here? Yeah, we're definitely going Burrow here for the reasons I just said. <clears throat> All righty. I'm on that. Um, and I feel like it's, it's weird because, you know, I was listening to who was I, uh, the dynasty builders podcast, um, the new DLF, uh, family podcast that, that we just added. Um, and they had on Ryan McDowell to talk about quarterbacks and, um, the, the top 10 quarterbacks in ADP right now, and who's most likely to, to still be there in that top 10 next year. Um, and they were talking about Joe Burrow and two as well too, but specifically for Burrow, you know, they were commenting on the fact that we've never really seen quarterback hype in a rookie um, like we have with Joe Burrow, maybe Baker Mayfield. Um, but, you know, he gained all of his hype more so in year two, whereas Joe Burrow is already a top 10 quarterback. I think he's like eight or something like that in Superflex ADP as a rookie. Um, and two is like almost right there as well, too. I think he's 11 or 12. Um, so, you know, they're both like right there for rookie quarterback. So it's just really interesting to note how much value they already have and we've never even seen them play in the nfl level before so it's just um you know because they mentioned like jared goff was definitely not hyped like that as a number one quarterback um wentz wasn't either baker maybe um kyler was like around qb1 i believe um but he wasn't you know at least not as high as joe burrow was so an in interesting observation there and it's um i i mean i'm on board with joe burrow but um, you know, it's, there's, there's risk there, but you know, there's also the opportunity that, you know, he is what he is and he becomes a top five quarterback next year for dynasty. So, yeah. And I also think in this case, you know, we had been hearing about Tua for years and he mm -hmm. had some amazing college seasons before getting hurt. And if he didn't get hurt, I still hold to this, that he would have been the number one pick and Burrow wouldn't have been. Um, so you have two guys, one who just had the best college season of all time and one who stepped in as a freshman and led his team to a championship game and generally was just an amazing quarterback. And if you look at some stats that showed he had like the most efficient college quarterback seasons of all time by far and away. So you're talking about two 
prospects coming up that everyone's super excited about with good reason. And I'm with you. I'm generally not a guy who buys into the rookie hype, but I've also started building my teams much more to also tradeability, meaning mm-hmm. even if I don't necessarily love a guy, if other people do, I take note of that. And because it insulates their value a bit, where even if Burrow flops a little bit this year, everybody will still remember that season from before and say, oh, he's just adjusting. And, you know, there was COVID and that messed up the rookie camp. So he still has another year to figure it out. And I doubt his value would fall that far, even if he didn't have a great season. Yeah. Yeah. That's, that's a a great argument to make too. I feel like that's what you can make the same argument for a lot of these rookies. You know, a lot of people say, well, this rookie could be a really good opportunity to buy lower than his current price right now. And I'm not sure, I'm not really sure that there's a lot of rookies that you can make that argument for. Um, you, you know, like people were talking about uh, maybe DeAndre Swift is a good one. Maybe J.K. Dobbins is a good one. I'm like, people are on these guys now, but if they don't do well, they're still going to be on them next year for whatever. Like J.K., like if Mark Ingram's away, he's like a top 10 running back automatically. Um, you know, and like DeAndre Swift, if if when carry on bounces out and say he's the only guy, again, we're looking at a potential top 15 running back, maybe RB1 for that for for swift and and, you know there's just i think these rookies are you know a lot of people always say it that the rookies are is are going to be the cheapest that they have ever been in their career you know like right now um and you know i still i i kind of i held true to that um you know a lot of the times and i think you know like you said even if burrow kind of flops this year his situation might even improve next year and like you said you know the excuse is well covid well mini camp well you know, he's a rookie, blah, blah, blah. They're going to, you know, they're still going to be all that stuff um, for a year or two. They're not going to jump ship um, immediately uh, on, on at least him and Tua and a lot of these other rookies. So um, I, I like that a lot. So 5.11 here, we're on the clock. Fifth pick. The rest of the the players that went, uh, Swift, Montgomery, Wentz, Cortland Sutton, Travis Kelsey, Cooper Cup, Keenan Allen, DK Metcalf, Kenyon Drake, Stefan Diggs, and then Baker, Daniel Jones, Debo, J.K. Dobbins, Calvin Ridley, Tua, Devin Singletary, C.D. Lamb, Aaron Rodgers, and Matt Ryan. So at the 5.11 here, to give you a list of the players available, um, quarterbacks, Matthew Stafford, Jared Goff, Sam Darnold, Drew Locke, Jimmy G, uh, Cousins, Tannehill, Herbert, and Bridgewater. Running backs, Cam Akers, Todd Gurley, Kareem Hunt, Le'Veon Bell, Chris Carson, Keyshawn Vaughn, uh, James Conner, da- David Johnson, uh, a bunch of those vets. Uh, wide receivers, A-Rob, Jerry Judy, DJ Chark, and Terry McLaurin, Jalen Rager, Tyler Lockett, Robert Woods, uh, and then tight ends, Mark Andrews, Evan Ingram, Zach Ertz, Hunter Henry, Darren Waller. Um, Hawkinson's there as well, too. So 5.11 here. Um, what are we looking to continue to, to build out this team here? We, we have yet to dip into the wide receiver and the tight end pool. Um, I have a feeling we might be doing one of those pretty soon here, um, but I'm interested. 5.11 here, what are we looking to do? Yeah, so I'm going to uh, go with Mark Andrews here. And the reason why is I believe that he will be a top two tight end this time next uh, offseason, just because Travis Kelsey will dip a bit because of age. And we talked about the Ravens offense a second ago with J.K. Dobbins, but Andrews is in an explosive offense with a quarterback who maybe doesn't throw a ton, but when he throws, he's pretty efficient. And the offense scores a ton of touchdowns. That's what you're looking for of your tight ends. And he's young and young tight end breakouts don't tend to happen. So I'm happy to take him there and not have to worry about the tight end position after this. Yeah. I honestly, I think that's who I would have taken as well too. And I had like a pretty good inkling that that's who you were going to take. You're a big Mark Andrews guy. Um, Mm -hmm. So I I really like that. And I think, uh, I think Sam also took Mark Andrews because I don't know um, if this, if the algorithm just like doesn't like Mark Andrews (laughs) or, or doesn't like tight ends, I'm not really sure. Um, but he falls in in these mocks, which again I don't I don't think is all too accurate, especially not in the fifth round. Um, but uh, Mark Andrews is is I think a fantastic buy, um, is, even as a, a a buy high at the tight end position because, like you said, you know tight end two um, more than likely next year, just because if he does something similar to next year, and even if Kelsey does what he usually does, you know the the age argument is going to be there. Um, especially even though that Kelsey's paired with Mahomes, Mark Andrews is paired with Lamar Jackson, and that offense is going to be on the rise. And then you're just looking at the age argument, and then Kelsey also potentially 
Um, you know, there's there's other weapons around there. Whereas Mark Andrews, at least for right now, looks like the top target, or at least the one A one B with Hollywood. Um, so there's you know definitely a lot of opportunity going Mark Andrews' way. Um, and so I, I I love grabbing him, and I think you you were on him even before last year, whenever he broke out. So that was a fantastic call on yeah, your my, part. Uh, I wish I listened. <laughs> my friend Zach and I, uh, it's funny. We go through phases where we disagree on players and phases where we agree. Generally, when we agree on players, those players tend to break out. I'm not saying like there's any kind of stats behind that, and we've never really tracked it, but we've noticed generally in preseasons when we agree on a particular player, that player seems to have a breakout season. So if you notice uh, lopsided trades and I talking about a player we agree on, I'd pay attention to that, even (laughs) if it's just a narrative that we've uh, built up. But yeah, Mark Andrews is great. And as you mentioned, his main competition for targets is Hollywood. And I don't dislike Hollywood as much as some people do. But at the same time, he has had historically going back to his college career, trouble staying on the field and staying healthy. So when that's your main competition, it seems like a no brainer to take Mark Andrews there. Yeah, I'm I'm all about that one. So I don't think we need to talk much more about um, Mark Andrews because it was a fantastic pick. So 6.02 here, um, the, the two picks were Jared Goff and Le'Veon Bell. So we have uh, basically the same player list uh, in terms of quarterbacks. It's Stafford, Darnold, Locke, uh, Jimmy G, if you wanted those names. Uh, running backs still, Akers, Todd Gurley, Kareem Hunt, Chris Carson. Uh, all these wide receivers are still here. A-Rob, Judy, Chark, McLaurin, Rager. Um, and then... Evan Ingram, Zach Ertz, and Hunter Henry, uh, and Darren Waller at the the tight end position for the people out there watching. Um, so 6.02 here. Um, still haven't dipped into the wide receiver position. I don't know if you want to go that way or if we're still looking on building uh, quarterbacks or running backs, uh, but what, what are we looking to do here? Yeah, we're going to dip into the wide receiver position, and I took <laughs> a slight risk that this guy wouldn't come back, but I figured he would, and that's Allen Robinson. Uh, Allen Robinson has played with pretty much garbage quarterbacks for his entire career. And that hurts me to say as someone who formerly proclaimed his uh, love for Blake Bortles. But, and I'm not saying Nick Foles is even necessarily an upgrade over Mitchell Trubisky because outside of the playoff run, we actually haven't seen Foles be all that successful. But Allen Robinson gets it done anyway. And he's like a back end wide receiver one in most seasons that he's played when he's been healthy. So I'm happy to take him when we've gotten him and get all those other positions pretty much figured out and get him as our top wide receiver, even if it's a little bit later. I, I love Allen Robinson. And honestly, like it's, it's insane to me that he's only 26, right? Um, Did he, I don't know if he just turned 26 or if he's turning 27. I'm unsure too, but yeah, he, Um, it seems like he's been in the league forever and should at least be like, 30 or something, but he's not. <laughs> he turns 27 in August. So he'll be 27 right before the season starts, um, which is still, I mean, we're, or he's entering the prime of his career and he's already been so good. And I think people um, prior to this season were just so, you know, attached to the fact that the 2014 or when was that? No, 2015 season um, was a, a, just a massive outlier, the 1,414. Um, cause then they're like, well, look at his rookie year. Then the following year, he, um, he gets hurt in week one after having a really good first half. <laughs> um, and then, you know, goes to Chicago and doesn't really do anything there either. Um, kind of battled injuries as well. And then now another breakout season for him, uh, at, in his fifth season. And, uh, yeah, I mean, I'm just, I, I'm, I'm all in on a Robin dude. I feel so bad for him. His quarterback situation even dating back to when he was at Penn State, like Christian Hackenberg was not it. it he was he was not. And people people wanted to make something out of him, um, you know, around the draft season whenever he was coming out. And for some reason, he was a second round pick. And I'm just sitting here as you know a, a kid who watched him uh, Hackenberg play at Penn State every single week and, and went to Penn State. And I'm like, man, I just don't know what people see in Christian Hackenberg. He was so bad. Um, which is funny because now it's interesting. He's going after like an MLB career or something like that as a pitcher. Yeah. I don't really know what's going on. But it's uh, honestly hard to find a player, at least that's currently active, that I think has had a string of worse quarterback play <sighs> than Allen Robinson. You you talk about Aaron Rodgers not getting any wide receiver help. <laughs> a Rob's not getting any quarterback help at all. I feel so bad for him. Maybe um, the Packers he, should trade for A Rob or should have oh, traded for A Rob. I would be in on that. I'm all for it. Let's do it. 
<laughs> I love it. I love the pick. Um, you know, you're talking about a, a, an alpha wide receiver and probably the cheapest alpha wide receiver in dynasty or redraft. Um, and and as, as your wide receiver one in the sixth round, I'm all for it. I love it so much. Um, I, I think I should just stop talking about how much I love Allen Robinson. We'll move on to the seven, seven, 11 pick here. Um, the, all the players that went after a Rob cam Akers, Marlon Mack, Todd Gurley, carry on Johnson, Jerry, Judy, Evan Ingram, DJ Chark, James Connor, Terry McLaurin, Tyler Lockett, Zach Ertz, Chris Carson, Tyler Boyd, Matthew Stafford, Kareem Hunt, Sam Darnold, Hunter Henry, and TJ Hawkinson, and then Cousins and Ryan Tannehill um, were the two quarterback picks right before us. So uh, 7-11 here, best quarterbacks available right now. Drew Locke, Jimmy Garoppolo, Justin Herbert, Teddy Bridgewater, Drew Brees, and Tom Brady are both there, as is Gardner Minshew. Uh, running backs, Keyshawn Vaughn, David Johnson, Darius Geis, Sonny Michel, Philip Lindsay, Zach Moss, uh, Raheem Mostert. This is where I told you kind of – Running backs start flying off the board here um, as we get into these you know, later rounds into almost the 10th and 11th round. Um, and then wide receivers, Jalen Rager, Robert Woods, Justin Jefferson, Jarvis Landry, Devontae Parker, Michael Gallup, Hollywood Brown, Adam Thielen, uh, and then Darren Waller, Noah Fant, Austin Hooper, Dallas Goddard, Higby, Gesicki, um, a bunch of tight ends there, all these late round guys that a lot of the industry loves. So 7-11 here, um, we got two quarterbacks, two running backs, a tight end, and a wide receiver as our roster what are we looking to continue to build this one out with so this one is a tough one because i really really like robert woods as a player and he's criminally undervalued and pretty much always has been but now he's getting to that age in dynasty where no one's going to want to trade for him anymore and no mm -hmm. one's wanted to trade for him before so it makes me lean rigor a little bit and the reason i say that is because he i believe will be sooner rather than later the wide receiver one for the eagles and Carson Wentz is a good quarterback when he can stay healthy, at least. And they have a good offensive system. So Rager is the ascending asset, whereas Woods is descending. And based on what I said earlier about trying to maintain some of my trade value, I think I'd probably go Rager here. But it is tough. And I do also see, I have to point it out, I wouldn't go him over these two guys. But uh, my other guy is there, which is Jarvis Landry. Uh, I've hyped up Jarvis Landry every offseason and got in, into multiple fights with people about why Jarvis Landry may be the most unappreciated fantasy asset of all time. But we're going to take Jalen Rager here. All right. Yeah. Yeah. I like that a lot. And it's something that I've been, you know, trying to get better at as a dynasty owner as well, too. It's, it's, it's like you said, just trying to maintain trade value on your roster and not trying to take on all of these depreciating assets, even though they are amazing producers in the NFL and that you'll need them, you know, to, to make a, a full championship run. But, you know, when you look at just overall trade value, Jalen Reger is like you said, a, an ascending asset and he should continue to be. Whereas Robert Woods, who I think is like a lighter version of Adam Thielen um, because he's like a year younger produces slightly on a lower level than Thielen. Um, but, you know, nobody in the industry cares about either one of those guys. And Landry's starting to enter that conversation as well now, too, um, especially as we're getting this new influx of wide receiver talent, um, plus all of the 2019 wide receiver rookies like DK, Chark, McLaurin. Uh, well, Chark's third year, but, you know, those types of, of players as well, too. Hollywood, um, it's, it, there's a lot of youth right now that's pushing out these um, older veterans who are still super productive, um, but we have to pay attention to the market and understand that, these young wide receivers, yeah, they're going to start producing here, um, and they might they might not be at the same clip as some of these other guys. Some of them probably will be and most likely will be, um, but those are the ones that the community cares about and the ones that the community is going to want to trade for. Um, so that, I think that's a, a super important observation um, and, and strategy and tactic for Dynasty is just understanding the market and knowing which assets are going to appreciate and depreciate in value. Um, and and yeah, Jalen Rager is going to be one of those. There's also a balance to be had where you don't want to go all youth and rookies because then mm -hmm. your team may just totally bust if they don't produce at all. But I think with some of these picks, it does make sense to go that way. And it is something that I've started to consider more because I'm not going to lie in past spots. I would have been like, oh, Rager hasn't shown it on the field yet. So I'm going to take Woods or Thielen here. And then you know, a year later, maybe I'd have a championship, but a year later, I'd probably be like, well, now no one wants to trade for these guys. <laughs> and uh, 
their production is slowly starting to go downhill. So yeah, this is good for my roster. <laughs> yep. Yeah. You're, you're not going to be able to trade Robert Woods or Jarvis Landry next year for like a high second. Um, even though they're still really good. <laughs> yeah. That that's, uh, that's the, the name of the game that we're playing right now. And it's, it's important to understand that. So 8.02 here, Darren Waller and Jimmy Garoppolo were the two picks off the board at the turn. Um, so Quarterbacks, still a bunch of them. Drew Locke, Justin Herbert, Teddy Bridgewater, Breeze and Brady, Minshew, uh, Big Ben, Dwayne Haskins, Derek Carr, Newton's down there as well too, Phillip Rivers, Jordan Love. Um, a bunch of these kind of quarterback threes here. Um, running backs, Keyshawn Vaughn, David Johnson, Darius Geis, Sony Michelle, Phillip Lindsay, Zach Moss, Raheem Mostert, uh, Mark Ingram, Alexander Madison, Tony Pollard is there, um, a bun bunch of those guys. Uh, still wide receivers, Robert Woods is still there, Jefferson, Jarvis Landry, Devontae Parker, Michael Gallup, Hollywood Brown, Adam Thielen, uh, Kirk, Ruggs, uh, and then all the tight ends, Fant, Hooper, Goddard, Higby, Gasicki, Hurst, Janu, um, Howard. Yeah, there's, there's a lot of those those guys as well, too. So uh, 8.02 here. We only got three picks left, uh, counting this one in this 10-round mock draft. Uh, so where are we going to be looking to, to go here in the eighth round? So this is a pick where, again, I would – in some cases, I might go Woods or Landry, especially because we just went Rager. It depends on what I was trying to do with my team. But because I've been preaching appreciating assets <laughs> and getting that way, I'll be happy to take Justin Jefferson as our wide receiver three. And the main reason is I think he's good. He was a first round pick this season in dynasty drafts. And they just lost digs. And I'm not saying, you know, quote unquote, vacated targets, but something that uh, Peter Howard talks about instead of good vacated targets is good players get targets. And Justin Jefferson is a good player in a team that now has one less player, to, good player to throw to. So that's why I went that way. Um, it's also interesting. I didn't do this intentionally, but you can see that after not going wide receiver early, I really hammered on the wide receivers. Mm -hmm. But after getting those three, I'd be pretty content, I think, for a while. Uh, but that's just my thought. Yeah, interesting because um, I mean, none of the no wide receivers other than Adam Thielen went. So I feel like we're <laughs> really going to test if you're going to stop hammering out wide receivers here. Um, but yeah, um, I, I I love the the overall core that you've built with A Rob Reger and Justin Jefferson. One thing I did want to want to ask you about um, would be where does Hollywood Brown fit into kind of this um, this order here um because uh, you know a lot of people um and i'm starting to you know kind of get on board with this a lot of people are really seeing marquise brown as a 2020 second year wide receiver breakout um with lamar jackson you know a lot of people are talking about how he was playing on one leg last year and still produced like 500 yards on 40 receptions um so i think there's there's a lot of hype around him um and so i'm just wondering overall where where you see marquise brown fitting in maybe with this 2020 wide receiver class and some of these other uh wide receivers because i personally i don't i don't think i um agree with him being down here below like parker or gallup or, or maybe even landry and woods just depending on your team build overall um and I, i'm curious on you know i don't i don't know what my decision would be between hollywood and justin jefferson or or even jalen Rager, who i still love um, so I'm curious on your thoughts on that. Yeah, he shouldn't be below the guys you just listed um, for the reasons we've pretty much already talked about where he's a young wide receiver with some upside. So his value could boom. My thing with him is I know that it's not necessarily predictive, but he has had some injury history. Um, the Ravens are a run first offense. And we also talked about Mark Andrews earlier. And I think Andrews is just a better player than Hollywood. I don't think Hollywood is necessarily bad. It's just I never think as long as Andrews is around that he'll be the quote-unquote go-to guy for the passing game. And then as we talked about earlier, they also have Dobbins who has shown he's capable of catching some passes as well. So I really don't know where I fall on uh, Marquise Brown. And part of that is why, you know, you often see him ranked in like the 40s among dynasty wide receivers. And that's where I think people typically go where they're like, well, he has some upside, but he could also suck. That's what I call like the mystery box range where people are like, he's young and maybe talented. So I want to rank him highly enough that I don't look like an idiot if he breaks out.
but I'm also ranking him low enough that if he doesn't, no one's going to get mad at me. <laughs> He's like, it's like Deontay Johnson as well, too. I think kind of fits in that mold. Uh, yeah. And I think he's even right in that range. Like I think I've seen him in like the 48 to like 50 range of dynasty rankings. Yeah. Which is, which is interesting because I think it was, I think I was listening to uh, JJ Zacharyson or I think it was him who said this, but he was, he was saying about how Hollywood and Deontay are two of his favorite um, 2020 wider or 2019 wide receivers to have a nice breakout 2020 season. And um, I think he pointed out that, I, I think it, I don't know if it was both of them, but at least Deontay has a higher redraft ADP than a dynasty ADP, which is, which is kind of weird. <laughs> yeah. That's um, really weird. Yeah. Uh, so maybe that's something that we need to start taking advantage of as dynasty owners go check out who owns Marquise and Deontay, because if that is the case is that we like them more in redraft, but not in dynasty, it's, really weird so maybe we need to start correcting that as a community <laughs> yeah and before um the debo samuel news so i actually in that startup i was talking about earlier i drafted marquise brown and i ended mm -hmm. up trading a ton with uh, my good friend dustin church at dynasty junkies ff on twitter and i eventually i think i got marquise brown from him in a deal or no i didn't draft marquise brown i got marquise brown from him in a deal and for a second i talked myself into brown because he was on my team now so of course he was going to be good and then I was like, you know what? I'm going to try to take him in a second and convert him into a wide receiver that I like a bit more. So I actually traded him for Debo before Debo broke his foot. Mm. Um, I mean, this was about a month or two ago. So it wasn't like an immediate, like last year I traded for Andrew Luck in one league. I traded Matt Ryan in a first and Andrew Luck pretty much retired the next day. So that uh. was tilting. But at least the Debo thing, it was like, all right, I did this a month ago. It's not the next day. I'm not going to be that upset about it. Mm -hmm. But it just shows to show that I don't fully trust Brown because uh, I think a lot of people would have Debo in the same range, but I was willing to pay a second on top of Brown to get Debo back. Yeah, interesting. So, um, yeah, I, I appreciate you sharing the your feelings on, on Marquise Brown, and I think that's really interesting. I think, you know, he is one of those polarizing guys, so I always like to hear how um, different people value um, some of these some of these 2019 guys. So um, 9.11 here and then 10.02. These are the last two picks of this 10 round mock for us uh, here at the turn. So uh, to give you the lay of the land here, uh, quarterbacks, Teddy Bridgewater, Gardner Minshew, Ben Roethlisberger, Dwayne Haskins, Derek Carr, uh, Winston Rivers, Love, and Trubisky are still there. Keyshawn Vaughn, Alexander Madison, Tony Pollard, Matt Breda, Tariq Cohen, AJ Dillon, Rashad Penny, Antonio Gibson, uh, Jordan Howard is there too. Uh, and, uh, Wide receivers still, <laughs> like I said, a bunch of these guys, Robert Woods, Jarvis Landry, Devontae Parker, Michael Gallup, Hollywood, Kirk Ruggs, Nikhil Harry, T. Higgins, Pittman, uh, Cooks is down here, Darius Slayton, T.Y. Hilton, Deontay, yeah, so many, so many guys. And then tight end, Tyler Higby, Mike Kosicki, Hayden Hurst, Johnny Smith, Ian Thomas, Gronk, Blake Jarwin, Njoku, Ebron, uh, Dawson Knox, Sternberger, Jared Cook, a um, bunch, bunch, bunch of of these tight ends so uh 9.11 here and then we'll get into the 10.02 um where are we looking to uh with our last our second to last pick here uh, of this 10 round mock yeah we're gonna i mean it's just the value we're gonna continue with wide receivers um <laughs> and in this case even though i just kind of dumped on him uh and actually go back to the wide receiver list because i feel like the adp might be a little bit out of order you know, I could actually, and maybe this is just me uh, being a bit biased, I could make a case, at least personally, for uh, T. Higgins, uh, Pittman, even Mims, and Darius Slayton all to be over Marquise Brown. Um, I know that's Whoa. probably a hot take. <laughs> but, but that said, I am going to take Marquise Brown here because I know a lot of the community does like him in the Ravens offense. And as your wide receiver four, he's a little less risky than if he was your number two or three guy. So I don't really mind taking the uh, shot there. And now go back to uh, quarterbacks for a second, because here's where we start to get to that range where it gets a little bit iffy from who you're going to have as your quarterback three, at least if I am not missing anybody lower on the list. But you know, when you start seeing Jordan Love on that list, that's a little scary. Um, <laughs> yeah, Stidham would be the only, and, and Nick Foles, I guess, are the only two starting quarterbacks. Hurts, Dalton, Mariota, Tyrod, Taysom Hill. 
Yeah, and it's usually <laughs> around the ninth or tenth that I like to take my third guy. Um, in this case, I would probably, considering that we already went youth, I would probably actually take a guy like Philip Rivers, or I'm going to, this is a like planning your flag moment, um, just because I've had a lot of people tell me that, first of all, I need to address something else that happened in this draft that I appreciate, <laughs> which is that you called Drew Locke a QB3, and there have been people hyping him up as the next like breakout quarterback, and I just don't see it. And I've become like, <laughs> the president of the anti-Drew Locke fan club. I love um, it. Second of all, there's a guy here that I've said was better than Drew Locke in his rookie season, which is Take true. And it. he's been hated on. And there's been a bunch of people who've told me he will not have a job next season. So we're going to take Gardner Minshew yes. as our quarterback three here. Yes. I wanted you to take Gardner Minshew basically even before we even got on. <laughs> yeah. Um, I, yes. I'm so in on. I'm so glad that you took him. Um, don't mind wow. the B plus. They hate every draft that we do. They hate it. <laughs> Um, John got like an F minus. <laughs> <laughs> well, did John just go like 10 quarterbacks? Yeah, I think we took like seven. <laughs> that does not surprise me. I've heard in like leagues where you don't actually have to fill a certain position. I've heard him talk about, and I can't do this. Like kudos to the people who can. In my head, I have to have like a certain amount of certain positions, but there's some people who are just like, yeah, I'm going to take 20 quarterbacks and you're going to have to trade me for one. And I set the market, so good luck. Yeah, I hate that. I don't think it works either. I'd love to know how much that actually works. <laughs> I've seen it work for at least one person, but I just can't do it. It's just like logically my brain does not work that way. I'm like, nope, you have like two or three of these guys or four of these guys and like 10 of these. And yeah, I'm going off on a tangent, but uh, <laughs> it was just interesting. And I know that's a typical John thing to do would be to take like seven or eight quarterbacks. <laughs> So, um, so just to kind of hit on the last pick here, Gardner Minshew, um, I know that you love him and, um, that, that, you know, you even, there's a picture of you around where you were, uh, <laughs> dressed like him in his whole, uh, wrestler. Uh, I don't even remember what it was, dude. Like the wrestling belt. He was, he was posing I mean, with a championship wrestling belt was. while shirtless. Um, in George. Gar- <laughs> in short, Gardner Minshew uh, tends to work out a lot. Uh, what I found out recently is he is a uh, what's a, a commando type dude. So he hmm. will work out just in like shorts and nothing underneath the shorts. Um, so, you know, that's some I can't do that. But <laughs> I need Gardner Minshew to continue to be good because when he is, I if I grow a mustache, can look like him and raise a bunch of money for charity, which mm-hmm. is awesome. But it's also just, he's a guy who I like to root for guys who come out of nowhere. It's why I also like Adam Thielen. You know, he was a practice squad guy who turned into a superstar. Um, But the thing with Minshew is everyone's like, oh, it's just the mustache and the mania and the fact that he like drives around in RV. Yeah, those things are cool. But he legitimately had, I understand he had some issues with, you know, fumbles and interceptions, which is not great. But those are things that you can work on after being a rookie. He legitimately had at least a fairly good rookie season for a six round pick in particular. And that means he has a cheap rookie contract, which I'm sure the Jaguars love for their team building. And yet everyone and their mothers is like, oh, no, he's not going to be the quarterback next year. I think he's going to surprise some people. And I think that he will be fantasy relevant. Uh, hoping that this is not just another Blake Bortles situation. I can't seem to stay away from falling in love with the Jags quarterbacks. I don't know what that's about. Um, <laughs> but yeah, I, I don't know. I really like Minshew. And I think that the community is sleeping on him a bit just because he was that six round pick. He only won half the games he started. And meanwhile, I'm just going to put this out there. I've said it before. I'm sure I'll say it again. If you like Drew Locke, Ultimately, your reasoning for liking Drew Locke boils down to what people accuse Minshew of, which is Drew Locke won some games and he had that video of him rapping that everyone loved. So they're like, oh, Drew Locke can rap and he wins games. He's better. <laughs> Drew Locke is, could be a fine real-life quarterback. but And I don't think he will be a good fantasy quarterback, even with all that they just did in the draft. I'm Maybe it's just take Locke, but I which is ironic because there's a pun in there. But uh, I really just am not buying into the Drew Locke hype and would much rather have Gardner Minshew, especially with the ADP difference. 
So the thing that I liked a lot about the Gardner Minshew pick was whenever you looked at the quarterbacks that were also on the board there, it was, you know, Big Ben was there. I think I would t- I would take Gardner at, at this point over Big Ben uh, just in terms of longevity. And I pers- I don't know what Big Ben's going to be like coming back from the injury that he sustained last year. Um, and so the only other guy that I was really um, kind of curious on was Teddy Bridgewater just because he at least has job security, I think, for the next two years. Um, just the way that his contract kind of played out. He might get Nick Foles. I'm not sure. Um, but, you know, it seems like he would at least have some sort of stability. And he has good weaponry around him as well, too. Plus, you know, the potential of um, of Joe Brady as the offensive coordinator and Matt Rule as a new head coach. So um, Bridgewater would be another interesting guy that I would be targeting kind of as that QB3. Um, and then, like you said, Rivers would also be kind of a, an interesting, you know, veteran kind of name i'd rather actually have rivers than big ben i think um yeah i'd rather have rivers at this point yeah. too yeah 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 so um but i, I love the gardner Minshew pick and i was waiting for you to take him the whole entire time i'm just yeah. like i'm like if he could grab him it'd be perfect <laughs> what's interesting is uh so in this league and i keep referring back to it just because i've been very actively trading in it so i drafted uh, teddy bridgewater as my quarterback three and i think i did it in like the 10th round I did it over Minshew, and part of the reason was I had Minshew pretty much everywhere, so I was trying to diversify. And then Dustin, who I've also already referred to, approached me with a trade that was like Gardner Minshew and the – why am I blanking on his name? The running back that the Packers just drafted. A.J. Dillon. A.J. Dillon for uh, Teddy Bridgewater and Tevin Coleman. And so really I was just like, all right, I have Teddy Bridgewater and Gardner Minshew pretty close in my rankings. Maybe Teddy has a slight edge, but I'm getting a running back that I believe in slightly more, even though everyone hated the pick. I feel like the Packers were trying to tell us something by drafting him so high and getting rid of Tevin Coleman, who could be a guy, but is pretty much nothing at this point. So that made the difference for me. And then in this, one is partially a mock, and two, it's also um, – I just think that Minshew has higher fantasy upside than Teddy. I think that Teddy Mm -hmm. will be solid because he can screen to CMC and CMC could house it, or he can also throw to DJ Moore, who is another guy that I love. Mm -hmm. But I just think as a quarterback and with the weapons around him and what have you, that Minshew has higher upside than Teddy. And if I'm taking a quarterback three to mostly be a fill-in or maybe a potential trade chip, I'm going to take the risk that he builds some value. I even actually thought about Dwayne Haskins there, even though Haskins was really, really bad. Yeah, that, <laughs> that's the appropriate uh, reaction. But that's why I leaned to uh, Minshew, because he actually showed something in his rookie season on like Haskins. Yeah. No, I like that a lot. I like the the upside pick, the upside home run swing with Gardner Minshew. So the only other final question I have for you, you know, looking at your team right now, we have three, three quarterbacks, um, which I think that you're pretty content with. The wide receivers look pretty solid. I'm not sure if this would be a pretty accurate one, but A-Rob Rager, Jefferson, and Marquise Brown. Um, Mark Andrews, you locked up a a stud tight end. Um, And then you've got Jonathan Taylor and Clyde Edwards-Hilaire as your uh, two uh, running backs. So I'm just curious on um, how the kind of the rest of the draft would go the next, you know, 15 or 20 rounds. Um, You know, maybe some specific players that you might be trying to target um, the, the rest of your roster building here just to finalize out if this was an actual draft. Yeah. Um, obviously I would look at some running backs, but what I tend to do, and I think I've started to go this way, but I've also still can't fully commit to building around running backs. I usually get like two to three guys that I feel confident in and then basically just take like a few more dice rolls at running back. And then the rest of the draft, especially because as you said, we have our three quarterbacks, we have our tight end. I would just hammer wide receivers that I think have upside for trade value. Um, at the same time, you know, I don't know how the rest of the draft would go, but if quarterbacks are slipping, I would take those guys for trade value too post draft, but it'd basically be like a few more running backs, uh, depending who's on the board and then just hammering those late flyer wide receivers because why not? And they're the most likely to actually build trade value for me. I love it. I love it a lot. Well, Bobby, thank you so much for, for hopping on with me and, and running through this, uh, 10 round dynasty Superflex startup mock draft i appreciate it so much i'm glad we were able to 
uh, find a time to to get together and, and do this. And I, I have so many other ideas to get you on other other YouTube content. So I'm going to be talking with you um, after we record here. But um, just to let the people know um, where they can find you on Twitter, anything that you got going on. I know you write, um, you know, a, a decent number of articles for DLF. So anything that you want to shout out, uh, let the people know. Yeah, sure. You can find me at Rec Fantasy. That's R K E D Fantasy. Uh, if you've heard me on other podcasts, you've heard me say this before. I am not a Twitter tough guy, contrary to what John Bosch <laughs> likes me to believe. And you can find my work, as Addison just said, on Dynasty League Football. I haven't had as much time to write as I normally would like, but I have a few ideas I'm kicking around. You can also find me, which is something I've been doing a bit more regularly than writing at this point, is on my podcast that is a co-hosted podcast with Matt Price. It's the Superflex podcast, which is a weird niche of if you like quarterback and Superflex talk, and you also really like learning about non-domestic animals, then we've got a podcast for you. And that's Superflex with Z-O-O-P-E-R Flex. And we just released an episode today. So if you haven't checked that out, go and check it out. We had George Kritikos, Kritikos on, and it was awesome. It was some of the best dynasty strategy talk between him and Matt. And then I was just there. So make sure you check <laughs> it out. I love it. That's what we need was more dynasty strategy talk. That's what I try to do with this one. And more so than just, you know, what a mock draft should look like. But I'm here for dynasty strategy. So please go check out that Zuberflex uh, podcast, all of Bobby's work on DLF. Follow him on Twitter. All, the link will be uh, in the description for Bobby's Twitter down below. Um, so, Bobby, thank you so much for, for hopping on and joining me today. And to everybody watching, all the viewers out there, thank you so much for tuning in and watching this episode of Drafting Lessons. Please, if you're not already, subscribe to the DLF YouTube channel. Ring that notifications bell to get notified every time we drop a YouTube video like this Drafting Lessons video. Um, Ryan McDowell and Dan Myler's ADP show. Chris Allen and Adam Wildey's DLF mailbag show. Um, we've got some more content in the works right now to get another series and show that is with uh, Scott Connor and Shane Manila. Um, so that one should be super interesting and fun to listen to. Um, Shane's always a blast, and Scott brings a lot to the table in terms of dynasty knowledge and player evaluations. And then we got um, so even more one-off content in the works, whole bunch of stuff. We're going to be hitting DLF for the 2020 summer. Um, so I'm excited for all of it that's coming out over the next two months as we get into the season here. Hopefully that there is a season. So please subscribe, ring that notifications bell, like this video. Uh, drop a comment down below if you agree or disagree with any of Bobby's picks um, or just want to talk some strategy, got some trade questions, anything like that, we will be sure to answer it. So thank you guys so much for tuning in to this episode of Drafting Lessons, and we will catch you guys next week. See you.